Hi everyone, this is Dr. Messman Moore, and in this short video, I want to talk about etiology. And etiology is just really a fancy medical word for causes, and in this case, we're interested in the etiology of mental disorders. Now, you may be aware that currently our textbook doesn't really emphasize the medical model and talks a lot about other types of models of explanation. But I think it's really important for you to understand these terms because even though there are multiple viewpoints on what causes psychopathology, the etiological terms here, even though they're associated with the medical model, are used in all sorts of settings, from social work to counseling to psychiatry. So if you think that you might be interested in a helping profession, it would be good for you to learn these terms. So let's start with the term necessary cause. Now, just to hold for a second to backtrack, causes here with mental disorders are not always as clear cut as they might be with physical diseases and other entities. So sometimes with a necessary cause, we might be talking about a physical condition or a genetic factor, but in other cases, we're talking about more environmental or experiential factors. Now, what is a necessary cause? It's just what it sounds like. The mental disorder cannot occur without this cause being present. But let's take a step back and talk a little bit about causes or necessary causes in terms of general examples. So for example, a necessary cause to win the lottery is to buy a ticket. You won't win the lottery if you don't buy a ticket. Now, one thing that you might be thinking about is, well, if I buy a ticket, I don't always get the, the lottery jackpot, right? And that's true. So with a necessary cause, a necessary cause must be present for something to happen, but it may not be sufficient to make it happen. So we'll talk about that in a second. Water. Water is a necessary aspect of our living. We have to have water to survive. However, we have to have other things too. So water is necessary, but it may not be the only thing we need to survive. Do you wanna be president? Well, if you do, you have to be at least 35 years old. That's one of the requirements. So being 35 is necessary to run for president. And finally, if you want to do well on an exam, for example, you need to be awake. You can't be asleep. You might need to have a little bit of coffee or other caffeine. So being awake is a necessary cause for doing well on an exam, but it may not be the only thing you need to do to be successful. Let's move on. Okay, so we have necessary causes, we have sufficient causes, and sufficient causes are something that by itself will cause a disorder. So whereas necessary causes needed to be present for a disorder to develop, it didn't always inevitably lead to that. Whereas a sufficient cause is something that can basically get the job done. So what are some general examples of a sufficient cause? Well, you need to get to work or to school, or maybe not if we're all teaching online, but, but a DeLorean, for example, might be a sufficient manner of transportation. It might be a sufficient cause for getting us to where we need to go. But it's not the only way, right? We can walk, we can ride a bike. There's all sorts of different modes of transportation. So a DeLorean is a sufficient cause of transportation, but it's not the only cause. Here's another gruesome idea. What about the guillotine? The guillotine is a sufficient cause of death for most people, but it's not the only cause of death or the only method of execution. So the key thing to remember about a sufficient cause is it's usually going to be associated with the presence of a mental disorder in terms of abnormal psychology, but it may not be the only cause of a mental disorder. All right, let's move on. So we've talked about necessary causes and sufficient causes. Let's move on to contributory causes. A contributory cause is something that has to be present, but isn't the only thing that needs to be present for something to happen. In this example, if you wanna graduate, you need to make sure you fulfill all the requirements on your academic checklist. 
but that's not enough. If you owe your university money, you're probably not going to graduate. So you need to also make sure that you have uh, paid up your tuition bill. So a contributory cause is something that's important and necessary to have happen, but it's not sufficient by itself. So usually when we think about contributory causes, there's multiple contributory causes that are present for a mental disorder to develop. Let's move on to distal and proximal causes. Well, sorry about that. Let's talk about contributory causes in terms of disease and health. So smoking is a contributory cause to lung cancer, but there's other factors that typically contribute to lung cancer in addition to smoking. And some people get lung cancer without smoking themselves. So it's one of many factors that help increase the odds or likelihood that you get cancer. Similarly, Bullying is a contributing cause to depression and anxiety among children, but it may not be the only cause. And in fact, bullying may not be a contributory cause in the context of other factors. Okay, now we're ready for distal. So when we talk about distal and proximal, think about time. Think about relation in, in reference to the onset of the disorder. So distal factors are by definition something that has happened in the past, way in the past, not just recently in the past. So this is something if you think about an adult developing depression, for example, we might be thinking about childhood factors as distal factors for that depression. So one example would be having a, par a parental loss. So if a parent dies during your childhood, you are statistically at increased risk for developing major depressive disorder. We would call that a distal cause. That's something that has happened way in the past, not necessarily in close proximity um, to uh, the development of the disorder. Other distal causes include things like child maltreatment, adverse life experiences like poverty or um, having a mentally ill parent. Now, proximal causes are usually what we think of as factors that may cause or contribute or trigger a mental disorder in the acute phase. So proximal means close. So when we think about proximal factors, we really are looking for what seems to be the trigger. Now, when we think about assessment, we're asking about proximal and distal factors. We typically assess for proximal factors initially because this helps us understand why our client is seeking psychotherapy now. So one thing we know is that marital distress can be a proximal factor for depression, particularly in women. So there could be when someone, let's say a woman comes to therapy, for example, and presents with major depressive disorder, we might want to be sure that we're assessing for relationship satisfaction and quality. Similarly, proximal factors related to hopeless, uh, hopelessness and um, suicide, suicidal ideation may be a loss. For example, the loss of a relationship or the loss of something significant. For example, the loss of the um, opportunity to make a team, you know, like in high school for basketball or something like that. So proximal causes are causes that we're looking for. They're events and we think of them as triggering. They're happening close to the onset of the, the start of the symptoms over the disorder. So etiological terms are really important to understand. We can talk about sufficient causes, necessary causes, contributory causes, and whatnot. But it's really not that simple. One of the things we know in psych in uh, abnormal psychology and the study of psychopathology is that causes are often interacting. They're often cyclical. In the example I gave about marital discord and depression in women, one of the problems that we see is that depression in women can cause difficulties in relationships, but difficulties in relationships can cause depression in women.
So now we start to see this cyclical or back and forth factor. So this makes things very complicated. One of the things we try to do is determine the onset and the order kind of of operations, which risk factor is happening, how are they happening in relation to each other, and why do we want to do this? Well, we want, first of all, ideally to prevent mental disorders. So it's much more efficient to take an approach to prevention of, of mental disorders versus the treatment once the disorders have occurred. So if we know what factors may trigger depression, for example, or anxiety, for example, we might be able to develop either universal prevention programs where we hit everybody through like public service announcements where we educate the public about risk factors, or we may be able to target um, our prevention for particular groups of people who might be at risk. So for example, with the idea that children who lose a parent early in childhood um, to, to death and have bereavement at that time, and that they're at risk for depression, one thing we could do is um, offer services to families who are experiencing bereavement so that the child may be able to process that experience in a way that doesn't um, increase their risk for depression. Now, the other factor that I haven't talked about is protective factors. And this is related to resilience. Resilience is the quality of being able to um, persist and have healthy outcomes despite negative or, um, out negative or vulnerability enhancing factors. So I'm not gonna talk about that in this video, but the textbook does a really great job talking about resilience and protective factors. So you should make sure that you check it out. So this is the end of my brief video on etiology and etiological terms. And I hope that this was helpful and taught you something new in addition to what you read in your textbook. Thanks.